Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is Humpback Whales, a conservation success story. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Eddie Savage. Eddie, thanks for being here today. I always love seeing your name on the calendar. Can't wait to see what you got for us. Let's dive in. Right on. Well, thank you very much, Sunny. It's great to be back here and uh, presenting again for Natural Habitat Adventures. Uh, and today we're talking about one of my all-time favorite marine mammals, the humpback whale. Uh, of course, in British Columbia, I've been kind of working as a humpback whale viewing guide or whale watching guide since about 2008. Um, and I remember my very first season working, I was working as a kayak guide um, in a place called Johnstone Strait on the northeast coast of Vancouver Island. And this is a place that today is really well known for uh, for wildlife, for marine wildlife in particular. But I remember I was working like in what is now a core area of humpback whale habitat. And I saw one humpback whale uh, in that region through two full seasons, uh, you know, spending around 60 days per season um, in that region. I saw two humpback whales. Uh, the what we were doing was looking for orcas. It's a great spot for orcas, but there was only two humpback whales. Today, if you go to the same region, chances are you're going to see dozens of humpback whales. And, and there's been kind of a huge uptick in the population of humpback whales and the areas that they're using to feed on the British Columbia coastline. And this population uptick and, and kind of the, the migration back into inlets and coastal waters um, is, is something that's really been Kind of taking hold all around the world where in areas where there have been historic uh, extensive whale hunting so it's it's really quite exciting we'll get into that a little bit but um, i love talking about humpback whales because it's kind of like well it seems like every year there's more and more and more of them and they're becoming such a, a huge part of um, my guiding life so what makes a humpback whale this is today's presentation folks what makes a humpback whale we're going to you know, I'll give you the, the nitty gritty, you know, how big, you know, how long, how heavy, that kind of thing. And then we're going to jump into feeding strategies. And there is no doubt that humpback whales, so they're, they're probably one of the most charismatic of the whales as far as their feeding behavior and social behavior and that kind of stuff. Um, so we'll jump into that. And then we're going to talk about migrations, ranges, where they're found around the world. Um, I like to call them global citizens. Uh, because they are in all the world's oceans. Um, and then we're going to talk about past, future, and uh, or past, present, and future conservation initiatives um, and what's going on in, in some of the places that not have runs trips like Iceland and, uh, and in British Columbia, Haida Gwaii, the Great Bear Rainforest, that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll dive in there. So, huh, the humpback whale, everybody. Mega Patera Nova Andrelae. Basically, this means large winged. New Englander. Um, so Megaptera large wing, of course, comes from, you can see in the, the top right photo there of this breaching humpback whale, you can see those large pectoral fins. They typically are about one third of the body length of the humpback whale and they're the largest wings um, of any animal on earth. Um, one of the well-known behaviors of humpback whales is their affinity for breaching. And this happened, maybe you've seen a viral video of a humpback whale almost breaching on a kayak or something like that. Um, but it's also kind of a pinnacle of any humpback whale watching um, experience is it doesn't happen every time. But when it does happen, when a, a humpback whale launches itself out of the water like this, it's pretty darn extraordinary and shocking to see a 45 foot long animal flying. So one day, hopefully their wings get big enough and they can actually take off, but it's definitely uh, a pretty extraordinary thing that they do. So big winged New Englander. New Englander is kind of where the, the species was um, identified and, and, and that kind of thing. So uh, big winged whale, there you go. So what is a humpback whale? Let's start, we'll start with baleen. So they have uh, multiple rows of baleen plates, 270 to 400 baleen plates on each side of their mouth. They have a bumpy head. Um, you'll notice in this uh, this image here, um, I'm actually just going to get my laser pointer. This will be very handy. 
for this. So I hope you can see this. But uh, this whale here that's just surfacing, if you look closely at the, the top of the, the head there, it's got these bumps. These are called uh, tubercles, excuse me, uh, tubercles. And each of those is basically a, a highly dense fatty deposit that has a singular hair uh, growing in it. The ones that are on top of the head, we're not quite sure what they're for, um, but I'll just pop back here. Um, on the front edge of their pectoral fins, um, they also have tubercles here, uh, which are believed to help with uh, kind of hydrodynamics moving through the water and making them more streamlined and, and more maneuverable. Um, and that's something that's actually being looked at for um, both uh, sea and air design as far as uh, creating immense amount of lift um, using kind of the tubercle uh, pectoral fin design. So anyway, so they've they've got tubercles. And if you're looking at humpback whales and you're, or looking at whales in general, you see some far off and you're just like, oh, I don't know what that is. You can't get it quite down based on the, the dorsal fin or the or the, the coloration of the whale. Um, if you can see their head and you see that they've got those those bumps, those tubercles, that's going to definitely give you the check mark for a humpback whale. Um, they've got the darker top side, um, which is present or pre present in all of these uh, these images. And then when you see a whale kind of pop out of the water or you see the underside of a tail fluke, you'll see the lighter underside. They have uh, barnacles usually um, kind of in kind of the, the crevices, the nooks and crannies of the whale um, in areas that are, are less likely to get a lot of, uh, of pressure from water. Um, but they have a couple of different species of whales. Uh, one of the main ones is acorn barnacles. Um, and then there's another type of barnacle that grows from those acorn barnacles. And then they have a short, uh, oh, I misspelled that. They have a short um, kind of curved dorsal fin, but this, this, this dorsal fin of theirs can kind of come in many shapes and sizes. And sometimes it, it almost seems like it's not even present. And so we'll have a look at through the variety of pictures I'm gonna to share today, we'll, I'll show you all those. And then of course, this broad tail fluke um, that we see it kind of, comes in a, a variety of shapes and sizes, but distinctively it has this sharp V and these kind of points at the end, um, as well as uh, we'll, we'll look at the underside of some and talk about that a bit further. But here's another example of the dorsal ridge um, with my laser pointer there. Uh, it's kind of a, a little bit of a pinnacle. Some of them have a little bit more of a, a curve to them. Some of them have much less of a curve. But this is important because later on in the presentation, we're going to talk about um, identifying uh, humpback whales. So let's just get an idea of the size of them, uh, 40 to 45 feet long. The females are the largest at 45 feet or so. Uh, calves, uh, newborn calves are about 15 feet. Um, adults, 40 tons. Again, uh, adult females uh, are going to be upwards of around 45 tons. And then the calves are around 2,000 pounds um, there. So they're, they're pretty big. Pectoral fins about 15 feet. And then the baleen plates, we're going to see, I'll show you some pictures coming up of the inside of humpback whales mouths. Um, and they are looking at 270 to 400 baleen plates. And if you're wondering kind of what a baleen plate is, so it's basically kind of like a fingernail product or keratin protein um, that arranges itself in, in these plates where they have kind of fine bristles um, at the end of the plate. And those fine bristles, basically you'll have rows and rows and rows of them stacked up inside of the whale's mouth. And again, I've got some pictures here where you can see kind of really what the, the baleen looks like uh, on the inside. But those, those rows of baleen, um, basically it's, it's their filter. Um, and so you can see here, this is a humpback whale that's lunge feeding. It's got its mouth wide open. Its throat is pleated so it can expand when it opens its mouth to gulp, uh, gulp food. So it takes in all the seawater and all the fish and then closes its mouth and uses its tongue to basically push out the water. And then the baleen keeps the fish or keeps the krill um, behind. So when we're talking about what kind of food they eat, humpback whales are uh, baleen whales in general. Um, I like to kind of call them the, the more adapted whales, the better adapted whales. They're the creatures of the ocean that have figured out that they don't need to chase and hunt uh, individual prey. Um, they have incorporated ways to basically, instead of, you know, instead of spending a whole bunch of money chasing one animal, um, they, whole bunch, sorry, a whole bunch of time spending one animal, um, they can basically just relax, 
open their big mouths, kind of wallow on over um, and, and catch thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands of smaller animals. Um, and, and basically their, their kind of balance between energy expenditure and food intake um, is more favorable to being a larger animal. And so the blue whale is a great example. That's another baleen whale eating some of the smallest prey and filtering it through baleen. Humpback whales are the same way, but with those pectoral fins, not quite as big as uh, a blue whale, but more maneuverable and, uh, and quite charismatic. So anyways, food source, krill. Um, I'll show you some pictures here. Krill, copepods, anchovies, herring, et cetera, other small fish species. And this is one of my favorite things is every single day, each humpback whale is looking at about 1,500 pounds of food a day. And if you are a humpback whale that has moved to the, the northern or southern, depending on where the, which ocean they, uh, they inhabit, if they've moved to the northern kind of feeding grounds, this can go upwards of 2,000 to 2,500 pounds of, of food per day. So they're always working. Um, they need to get quite a lot of calories. So here's kind of their prey. We're looking at krill and we're talking, you know, krill is maybe one to two centimeters or about half an inch long, maybe a little bit bigger. Um, this one here uh, with my laser pointer, this is Pacific herring. They can, you know, reach quite a bit long, several inches long. Uh, we've got the northern anchovy. Um, this is another food source, again, several inches long. And then these are copepods. So they're, they're basically small uh, crustaceans, extremely small crustaceans, much smaller um, than your krill, um, but that's another good food source for the humpback whale. And then over here we have sand lance, Pacific sand lance, or in other parts of their habitat, like in Iceland, for example, they've got, uh, they, they're called sand eels. Um, and so it's another little tiny fish. They, they burrow down in the sand vertically, um, but they're, they're found on the seafloor uh, in the millions where they, where they have good habitat for that. So that's kind of what we're looking at. We're looking at 45 ton animal that uh, finds its delicacies in half an inch long to a couple inches long, so or several inches long uh, prey. Pretty cool. Um, so humpback whales, as I was saying, they're charismatic. They're quite exciting to watch feed. Um, they have some of the most um, kind of ingenious and clever ways of catching their food. Um, and uh, of all the baleen whales, I mean, and humpback or sorry uh, blue whales for example very very large they're much more kind of just open your mouth swim through your food and close it whereas humpback whales they're much more involved with their environment and with the landscape they're they're often found they can be found out in open water but they're also found in inland waters and when they come into the inland waters um, you start experiencing tidal currents you have lots of seabirds um, gulls uh, you have kind of the varied terrain or so, kind of seafloor um, terrain and, and terrain of the inlets and around islands and all that kind of stuff. And it basically creates all these different ways that, that humpbacks can, can catch their prey. So uh, I'm going to go through several of the feeding strategies with you here. Uh, one of them is the deep dive. So this one is super typical. This is usually usually the, the ones that I see, the, the, the main feeding strategy that I've seen humpback whales um, do, typical for hunting krill. Um, krill basically can kind of be at like a certain layer uh, temperature grade in the water or a certain out like uh, depth in the water um, and then the humpback whales will basically dive down. Um, typical five to seven breaths at the surface kind of might take a few minutes for them to do that and then you'll see their tail fluke like this uh, when they decide to do a deep dive. So it's really easy They kind of like launch forward using my arms, but their, their pectoral fins kind of kick their head up a little bit and then they arch their back and you can see that arch back and you know right when the back is arching out of the water, they're about to throw their tail fluke into the air um, and head down for a deep dive. The deep dives, I've timed it in nu numerous times, um, five to seven minutes. It's kind of the, the standard dive for humpback whale. They go down to about 200 feet um, and they might use kind of the seafloor terrain to, to either corner prey or, or yeah, basically push prey to where they want it. And it's actually like this 200 feet mark is, is pretty consistent. I've, I've been both in Iceland and in British Columbia and I've looked at the depth sounder on our, on our vessel or the, the nautical chart that I've got for a vessel. I'm just like, okay, this whale has been following almost exactly this 200 foot contour um, for 15 or 20 minutes and 
It's like, okay, that's a, that's a great depth. So of course they can fish shallower and deeper, but that seems to be a pretty standard kind of deep dive terrain is about to 200 foot uh, depth. Um, I've also seen with deep dives, humpback whales kind of doing um, a little bit of a semicircle around. You can have, imagine if you have a rock face, there's a rock face and then there's kind of some space of water. The humpback whale was several hundred feet. The humpback whale kind of was swimming um, back and forth and then it would kind of stop and turn and point directly towards land and then disappear. And what I think the whale was doing was basically kind of cornering prey, whether it's krill or, or small fish, probably krill where I saw this, this was kind of deep in an inlet, um, basically in swimming right towards shore, it would disappear completely for a couple minutes. And then right at the edge of the shore, it would pop up um, breathing, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't do a lunge feed. It would just kind of pop up and take a few breaths sitting in one spot. So what I think that that whale was doing was going down and then using the rock face, the rock wall is really, really steep, um, pushing the prey against it and opening its mouth, catching the prey, um, and then coming to the surface to rest after all that, all that hard work. That was pretty cool. Um, so deep dives, usually it's kind of one whale, um, but oftentimes uh, it, it can be more. It can be two or three whales that participate um, in deep dives. There's not a whole lot of strategy except being like this, you know, row of vacuums uh, for cleaning up all the krill um, down below. Now trap feeding is really cool. And there's a, there's a great look at those baleen plates. It really kind of looks like, almost like hair inside their mouth, right? And, and in a way it is, it's kind of like this fibrous uh, kind of fingernail material um, hair that, uh, that is there. So this whale is trap feeding. Essentially what they do is they lay vertically in the water. So their tail is down and their mouth is up. The top of their mouth is out of the water. Their, their jaw opens wide, that big, you know, pleated throat. Basically it's a big bucket um, on the lower jaw. It opens wide and it sits flush with the water. And the humpback whale basically sits there floating in the current, just using its pectoral fins to kind of gently sweep fish into its mouth. Talk about like one of the most um, kind of simple, relaxed, uh, intelligent ways to catch fish. Where, where there's areas, especially in British Columbia, where you have um, regular tidal current, little fish, krill, they can get, you know, moved from 100 feet down right up to the surface just in a few seconds with, with kind of fast moving water. And this can disorient them and confuse them. And so if you have a whale that's sitting here and, you know, two pectoral fins in that mouth, that's going to be a, a bit of a gathering space of about 40 feet. It can just kind of scoop and, and, and put, uh, put those little fish into its mouth. And so this whale, I watched this whale doing this. And I drifted probably about a mile in the current as it was just sitting there. And, and my group and I, we were in, I, was, I was driving a whale watching vessel and we're like, you know, 200 yards away. Um, we just watched this whale do this for probably probably 45 minutes um, feeding. And so what's interesting about this type of feeding is it was first observed in um, kind of in northern British Columbia. And when it was first observed, there was only two whales about 10 years ago. There's only two whales that were doing it. And now a decade on, there's almost 30 whales that are doing it. And so something that's pretty consistent in particular with songs and, and that kind of thing um, with humpback whales is their ability to learn from each other. And so there's, there, there may be some kind of uh, uh, communication or bulletin board down below that says, hey, you know, this really worked for catching this type of prey. But they, they're basically, the whales are learning from each other how to catch this, how to catch different types of prey. Or maybe it's just a behavior that has long existed but hasn't been observed. Um, but yeah, pretty interesting to see the trap feeding. Another one, which at first, when I first saw flick feeding, I was confused. I'm just like, what is going on? Like, is this whale alarmed? Is it stressed? What's going on? But I, I watched, um, I've seen it several times where, you know, I was about half a mile away and I just see this humpback whale tail, like flat, like thrashing in the water, just slapping the water, throwing water in the air for like five to 10 minutes. Um, and later on, I didn't really approach that whale because I'm just like, I don't really know what's going on here like that. I wonder, I hope that's not a stressed whale. Um, but later on, it happened again. And I was with a, a marine biologist who's just like, no, like this is, this is a, a pretty rare, like it's, it's common, but, but not often seen type of feeding, uh, which is called flick feeding. And what they do is basically they, 
they bring their tail down to the water and then they throw huge quantities of water in the air with krill and all and then slap the water again and then throw the water in the air again and basically they do this for yeah five to ten minutes and then they stop they spin around they might do a little lunge through where they just were but the idea is that kind of all that movement and slapping either will kill or stun krill um, that little that little shrimp type animal um, and they'll be basically all at the surface and so the humpback whale will thrash a bit spin around eat everything that it's um, stunned and then go and continue doing that later on so that's that's an interesting type of feeding flick feeding another one is lunge feeding so lunge feeding is quite interesting and this one is is one of my favorites um, to observe because it it requires kind of the assistance of so much more than just kind of the whale's ingenuity. It requires seabirds, diving birds, like common mirrors, rhinoceros auklets, uh, cassins auklets, um, guillemots sometimes, these types of species of birds that are basically uh, kind of sitting in, in areas of tidal turbulence um, in, in other places, maybe puffins are involved in this type of thing. I'm not sure, I haven't seen that, but they could be. Um, but basically the diving birds, um, we'll be sitting kind of an area of turbulent water where schools of fish are moving through and then the diving birds disappear. So they're sitting up on top making all kinds of fun kind of squeaking rattling sounds and then that goes quiet and they disappear down below. What ends up happening is they're basically kind of going and, and pushing themselves all around or, or pushing up against kind of a school of fish that's come through and those fish trying to protect themselves, they're, we call them forage fish, um, they kind of protect themselves by schooling together in a tight ball. And then the diving birds, basically, they're coming from all angles, including down below. The ball of fish ends up rising up to the surface and bubbling at the surface. And then this is where the gulls come in. So you can see in this picture that there's, you know, dozens of gulls swarming around. And sometimes these, this collection of bird of gulls can be hundreds. And they're just like swirling around and they're flying from all directions and they're making a heck of a sound. Um, and they're diving right down into where the fish are kind of bubbling at the surface, trying to get their, their part of this deal. So the ball of fish, it's being kind of attacked from the bottom, attacked from the surface. And then the humpback whale, and now I've observed this where the humpback whale has been like a mile away and it's doing its own thing. And then a, one of these forage fish balls starts up and it just turns directions and goes directly towards, like at high speed, directly towards where that ball of fish is. And I am going to suggest, so the tubercles um, on their heads, we don't know exactly what they are, but basically it's a dense fat with one singular hair. Um, one of the hypothesis, um, hypotheses essentially for why or how humpback whales find their prey is there's no way they can see a mile underwater. It's too dark, it's too far, and there's, there's, it's too, um, yeah, there's there's too much in the water for the for a whale to see that far, but the whale may be able to sense vibrations. Um, they're not they're not um, toothed whales. They don't have kind of the biosonar or or echolocation um, that like an orca would have or a sperm whale would have, um, and so they can't they can't kind of bounce sound off things to see. But they may be able to to pick up vibrations through. Um, these these tubercles, it's, it's one of the ideas, and, and that might help them pinpoint and, and move towards um, a ball of fish or, or a ball of prey. So they basically, the, the whale, let's, you know, it's moving high speed, you know, directly towards that ball of fish. A few hundred feet away from the ball of fish, it dives down, disappears, and then everything's like, okay, the whale's gone. The gulls are all swirling around making a racket, and then suddenly, everything gets quiet and the gulls lift off the water. They fly, you know, maybe five or 10 feet off the water because they can see the whale coming from beneath. And then the whale emerges underneath the ball of fish with its mouth wide open, flying out of the water, then shuts it closed, uh, closed over the, the ball of fish. And then the gulls kind of are like, okay, well, all the fish are gone. And then shortly after the whale emerges, all the diving birds, um, resurface because they're like, okay, well, all the fish is gone. And so all the animals disperse, the whale rests for a minute processing its meal. Um, I've seen on rare occasions them actually catch a gull accidentally and then kind of move a few yards and then spit out the gull. Um, but that's that's a really fascinating type of feeding and it's a ton of fun to see because you can see the, 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 
the um, the forage fish balls forming wherever there's like the swirl or tornado of gulls on the horizon, then you just have to cruise over there and find them. It's pretty cool. Excuse me. And then probably the best known uh, feeding strategy is bubble net feeding. So bubble net feeding, I've seen it once where it was done solo. It was just one whale on a super calm day. Um, it would disappear, it would spin around, you know, blowing bubbles in a circle, and then it would get quiet, and then it would rise up to the surface um, with its mouth open, kind of lunging through the fish that it had corralled. I don't know how successful it was. Um, the most exciting um, bubble net feeding, basically it was, I've seen it um, in, in northern BC. Um, this would be on like the, the spirit bears and humpback whales of BC trip that Nathab does. It was the same, the same trip. Um, basically, I was, uh, we were, we were in a very kind of calm area. I can't remember exactly where, but it was, it was in that kind of central coast region of British Columbia. Um, and we saw, I'm just going to show you this next picture here. So we saw this collection of whales kind of moving through on a calm day. Um, there was about, I think at the highest number, there was about 15 whales. And by the time we left, there was about seven. So they kind of like, you know, dispersed. Some whales came and joined, um, but it's a very social thing. There's obviously some communication going on between the whales, um, this, this coordination, this teamwork that is required. And so they'd all kind of dive. There'd be a few that would dive. And then it was like um, simultaneously, the rest of the whales would dive and then they disappear for a few minutes. And what we'd look for basically is we'd we'd kind of be scanning the water, we're sitting there, we don't know exactly where these humpback whales are gonna show up again. And so what they do is they dive down below and you can see in this picture, there's a nice ring. See that ring of bubbles on the surface? So the ring of bubbles, basically the, the whales dive down to, you know, maybe a couple hundred feet or a hundred feet down below where there's, there's some fish or krill. And then they swim in a circle, this coordinated circle, releasing bubbles. And the bubbles basically rise up to the surface, creating kind of this wall, this, this kind of noisy, vibrating barrier that drives all the fish and krill kind of towards the center and towards the surface. And while we were watching this, um, we also had a hydrophone. So a microphone for underwater, we had a hydrophone and we could hear the bubbles starting to kind of burble up. And then, we could hear kind of like this coordinated alarm sound or like a, a coordinated trumpet from the whales. It was, it really was like a And then when that would sound, we knew the whales were gonna rise up to the surface very quickly. Um, and so the sound would go, um, the trumpet would go, and then a few seconds later, all of the whales emerge towards the surface like this. Um, mouths open, a pile of whales, you know, I don't know, 500 tons of animal, it seems, um, 500 tons of animals all emerging towards the surface, mouths open, um, catching, uh, catching their prey in the middle of that circle of bubbles. It is super cool. So I'll just go back. Step one is the collection of the whales. Step two is the making of the ring. Step three is the coordinated rising to the surface, lunging through the, the kind of captured prey. And then step four, there's always a bit of time where the whales are just like a little bit disoriented, resting, pushing out the water, processing the food. And then they'll kind of reorganize and move on and do it again. And some of the, the lunge feeding sessions that, that I've seen lasted over an hour, um, just with whales kind of, if they found a good spot that's got good food, they'll kind of work together in that same zone for quite some time. So it's pretty, it's a pretty exciting thing to witness. Um, here's a, another look at some lunge feeding. And this is just quite simply to exhibit the biodiversity of the BC coast. Um, you've got lunge feeding uh, humpback whales that were, that are doing bubble net feeding um, underneath a whole bunch of gulls. There may even be some other species in there. Um, and then on the right, you can see that there's a bunch of stellar sea lions. Pretty cool. Okay, so talking about kind of communication, um, let's talk about humpback whale songs. So top left picture there, you've got Songs of the Humpback Whale, um, 1970 record that is, you know, probably the most popular um, kind of eco music or environmental music um, ever released. I was reading there's over, there's like 230,000 records sold. Um, for the songs of the humpback whale. And what it is, is it's a collection of 
kind of these haunting songs um, that male humpback whales make starting in autumn, moving on into um, through the winter um, in their breeding grounds. So we're going to get to kind of the migration of the humpback whale, but some humpbacks will kind of stick around in areas all throughout the year, but pretty much all the humpback whales, um, wherever they live on earth, do a summer winter migration. Um, summertime, they either go north, if they're in the northern hemisphere, they go north to their, their feeding grounds, and then in the wintertime, they go south to their breeding grounds. Um, uh, anyway, so um, these, are, these are songs that are actually pretty darn close to kind of the human um, hearing threshold. Um, it correlates with the breeding season starting up in autumn and moving through uh, the winter. Uh, kind of usually the songs start to taper out around March or April and also whales start to migrate away from their breeding grounds around the same time. Um, each song is made up of a variety of notes, tones, um, whines, grunts, squeals, um, and songs can last upward. They can last a few minutes or they can last upwards of 30 minutes, uh, which is pretty interesting. Now, even more so when it comes to communication, and we're talking about, you know, how humpback whales can communicate and do this extremely coordinated um, dance with the bubble net feeding. Um, these songs are also the same song sung by all of the male whales in a particular in a particular region. And sometimes that region, you know, it's more than just the, you know, a few hundred kilometers of coastline. It could be an entire ocean basin um, that the humpback whales are all singing the same song, an entire breeding ground or an entire, you know, the entire North Pacific Ocean the humpback whales are all singing the same song. And the song can evolve as well over weeks and months and years, um, sometimes changing a lot, sometimes changing very little, but the variation is constant. And when a variation is noted um, in one whale song, it becomes present in all of the other whales songs. So they're all communicating and, and sharing that information with each other and singing uh, the same song, which is really cool. Uh, another another uh, type of whale communication, there's a few of them, and you know, as far as what these mean, as far as what they're trying to tell us, one of them is tail slapping, uh, another one is pectoral fin, fin slapping, another one is breaching, and another one is trumpeting. So um, when it comes to tail fin, fin slapping or pectoral fin slapping, sometimes this can be seen as some kind of uh, aggravation or stress, um, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, unfortunately, a uh, powerboat maybe went by too fast or it was disturbed or in a social context, another whale showed up um, and and it could be kind of a greeting. It could be also like a, hey, you know, I don't want to hang out right now. It's hard to say. These are kind of the mysteries of the ocean that we are still trying to figure out. It's hard to learn about 45 ton migrating whales, but there's a lot of research being done to try to sort this stuff out. But sometimes social encounters as well, like when one whale joins up with a group of other whales, um, there might be some breaching that goes on. There's some, you know, a breach might be followed by more breaches. Um, breaches can also be potentially for stress, um, but there, there's lots to be learned about what they do. But it is, a, there is a correlation of kind of when whales breach and when whales tail slap and when whales pectoral fin slap. Um, and oftentimes it does have a correlation with either another whale um, or a vessel that's maybe made too much noise um, a distance away or, or maybe too much noise or too close, that kind of thing. Um, now the last one, trumpeting, is, is often associated with some of these things. It can be associated with uh, feeding and that kind of stuff. But what I find really interesting, there was this one time I was I was up an inlet watching humpback whales and I came across this one humpback whale that was sitting at the surface and it was trying to dive, but it was being harassed on all sides um, by Pacific white-sided dolphins. And so the Pacific white-sided dolphins, they're maybe two yards long, they're two to 400, two, or two to 300 pounds, kind of in that range. But there was, you know, 50 to 100 of them that were all kind of swirling around this whale. And you can only guess in that instance what was going on. But the humpback whale was quite obviously not happy. And the humpback whale was kind of like flipping its tail and slapping its pectoral fins. But one sound that I will always remember from that um, was every time it came to the surface, it made this really loud, strong trumpet. Um, and 
I can only think that that was uh, the the voice of a stressed out whale um, as it was being harassed by all of these specific white-sided dolphins. They do overlap in prey um, in some instances, like with herring or anchovies. Um, and so there might have been some competition, but also dolphins are, you know, dolphins may have just been having fun with the whale and the whale was not having fun. Um, an interesting encounter. Uh, so let's have a look at the global distribution of uh, humpback whales. And really, wherever there's room in the ocean for the whale um, to swim, there is likely going to be uh, humpback whales. So the Arctic Ocean, anywhere that kind of has that annual sea ice to an extent, uh, there won't be. And then Antarctica, wherever there's ice sheet, uh, there won't be. But in the, this, the waters around Antarctica, absolutely. Um, I've seen humpback whales in Antarctica. I've seen humpback whales um, in Iceland. I've seen humpback whales in British Columbia. So we, we're covering, or covering a pretty good uh, kind of latitude. Um, I think I've also seen humpback whales um, off the coast of of, uh, of Chile as well. So anyways, they're, they are global citizens. They are all over the world and they are separated into several distinct population groups um, with 14 key breeding grounds around the world. And I'll show you one of those. Um, on the west coast of North America, key breeding grounds are going to be Mexico um, and Hawaii. Um, and whales that end up in British Columbia and Alaska, humpbacks that end up in British Columbia and Alaska during our summer, they end up going to Hawaii and Mexico for their winter. Um, there has been uh, an account of a humpback whale that was seen um, in Alaska, British Columbia waters, um, also going to Japan. So there's some kind of intermingling among kind of these population groups. Um, and then there's kind of a, a similar distance or about, you know, 5,000 to 7,500 mile migration that humpback whales will make, um, kind of a return trip from summering grounds to breeding grounds. Um, but uh, yeah, so the global population is estimated between 60 and 80,000, which is which is amazing because it's uh, they were one of the one of the main species that was persecuted um, during kind of global whaling. It, they were because they're coastal uh, coastal whales, they were quite easily targeted. Anyhow. Um, so here we go. Uh, basically, these are your kind of summering and uh, or these are, these are going to be your summering breeding areas. And then your kind of winter feeding areas are depicted, at least in the north, you can kind of see um, the, the light yellow shading is where uh, whales are kind of going. But essentially, they go to the colder, more nutrient rich waters um, that are otherwise inaccessible throughout the year. There's kind of a boon. Um, in the Arctic or in the North, um, and it's the same in the South. There's a there's a boon um, of food, a huge availability of krill, um, uh, small forage fish, and that kind of thing that become uh, evident towards the uh, summer months. And then, of course, in the winter time, when uh, I'm just going to use British Columbia, BC, and Alaska, when those waters uh, become less productive, um, then they move to the South. Where they can go to Hawaii or Mexico uh, for their for their breeding and calving. Very interesting stuff. So let's talk a little bit about their conservation. Um, so as I was saying, because humpback whales um, are very coastal, um, they can be in the outer shores, but they're also uh, they have pretty significant site fidelity. So you can have populations of whales that come back to the same area year after year after year. Um, and they, you know, they they know it's good. They know that they can rely on the food source there, and so they would they would come back. They're seasonal visitors, um, and they come back to the same region year after year. And so, in British Columbia, for example, and on the west coast of of North America, you could actually have like in narrow passages, you could have land-based whaling stations where they know we know that humpback whales are going to go through here at one point or another, and so they just have a harpoon gun mounted on. Um, a rocky point or something like that um, that would make it easy and then they'd set it up. But oftentimes whaling sites wouldn't last more than a few years because once they depleted, the whaling sites had depleted the local population, there was no more whales there. So then they just move on. But industrial, industrial scale whaling, we've probably all heard about this in some shape or form around the world, greatly declined 
the majority of whale populations um, leading to the International Whaling Commission ban in 1966. It's interesting because it was, you know, 100 years of intensive hunting of these whales um, that depleted the populations to a point where some uh, populations are, con are considered extirpated and some populations are kind of at the brink of extirpation um, because they, they have not been able to rebound from um, from how low their populations got during industrial uh, whaling. So the humpback whale though is, is quite interesting. So let's go to uh, British Columbia here again as a bit of a case study. Um, there's over 14,000 humpback whales that were harvested in BC uh, between the 1860s and uh, 1960s. Um, there's land-based whaling stations, stations and and even up until the 2000s um, in British Columbia, there was only a handful of humpback whales um, that would come into the inshore waters. Um, the numbers have have rebounded quite a lot. It's thought that there was maybe about 3,500 humpback whales um, in the 1960s left in the kind of all along the BC coast in Alaska. Um, and that number is up over 20,000 now. So there's been quite a large uptick from quite simply um, not hunting them, uh, which is good. And so that, that's really exciting. Now, actually, I just want to point out this picture before we go to the next slide, because when it comes to identifying different individuals, how do we count humpback whales? Um, my last slide is going to be on photo ID, but this whale in this picture is a whale well known um, on the BC coast, or at least in kind of the northeast um, BC coast. It comes back to the same area year after year, and you can see on its tail. Um, it has all these kind of sharp lines. These are not propeller lines. Um, these are like from a boat or something. These are actually likely uh, from orca. So when humpback whales are calves, when they're young, they're predator. Um, not so much if you're an adult humpback whale, you can kind of successfully fend off orca pretty easily as a, as a much larger whale. Um, but as a calf, you're more susceptible to predation from orca. And so these are likely the teeth marks from orca that had bit, and then this whale got away. And so in British Columbia waters, uh, we affectionately give this whale the nickname Lucky. And so that's, but you can, you can definitely tell right away that that's the animal you're looking at based on the design and shape of its uh, uh, tail fluke. So uh, present day threats. With, uh, with international wh the International Whaling Commission kind of preventing all whaling and harvesting, population numbers have been able to rise, um, but future kind of conservation measures um, for humpback whales, ship strikes, um, they are baleen whales, they are slow moving, they don't get out of the way um, easily. Most ship strikes um, for uh, humpback whales have actually been small vessels moving very fast. So. They kind of live, they, they, they move right beneath the water's ocean and when there's, or right beneath the surface of the ocean and when they're sleeping, they might rise for a little bit, take a couple breaths and then sink right below the water surface. And even so, when they're traveling, they travel just underneath the water surface and only come up momentarily to breathe. So if you're in a high speed vessel and you're not, you know, maybe you're just going 25 or 30 miles an hour over water, you may not actually have the opportunity to see uh, that there's a humpback whale right in front of you. And so a lot of ship strikes are from smaller vessels, but there's, it's, it's harder for a small vessel to, to do significant catastrophic damage to, um, uh, to a whale. However, this picture on the left, this is a whale that, that migrated all the way from Hawaii um, to British Columbia. Um, uh, and it's believed that it was uh, hit by a vessel um, in, Ho in Hawaii and it migrated all the way back um, to, to BC with a broken spine, um, which is quite an exceptional feat. But this is kind of what, what, what comes into play is, you know, ship strikes, uh, either transportation or cruise ships or large vessels um, traveling, they, they don't have any means to get out of the way of, of a whale because they're so large, they can't turn. Um, and so they, the whales, it's the onus is on them to get out of the way of the gigantic ship. And so there's already places in particular um, in high density feeding regions around British Columbia where they have um, speed limits um, in place or they're, they're, uh, there's lobbying to put in kind of marine speed limits um, through high, uh, 
high activity humpback whale feeding areas as well as other whales uh, feeding areas to protect them so that they don't get struck by a, a 300 meter long ship going 15 knots uh, or, or 20 miles an hour. Um, and then another threat, uh, of course, is fishing gear entanglement. So if you're going for prawns, you're going for crabs, um, or there's trawling, um, the, like big kind of deep deep water trawling efforts, um, it all requires long lengths of lines and floats. Um, and this whale that I came across um, had basically one, or it has a couple of floats wrapped around its tail fluke, but it's wrapped around in such a way um, that it, it just gets tighter and tighter and tighter every time this whale tries to move. And the buoyancy um, of that, the larger orange float makes it impossible for this whale to dive. Um, so it could dive a little bit, but then its tail would just keep getting lifted up and it wasn't actually able to keep going. So it couldn't feed, it could breathe, um, but it, it couldn't feed properly. And so when I saw this, I know there was a team that went out that evening um, and the next morning to to track it down to, to clear off the gear. And I know that they managed to get the large float off um, and there's a good likelihood. I didn't hear any updates because I, I left the country. Um, but there's a good chance they were actually able to, to clear off all of the fishing equipment from this whale. But that's not always the case. It's not always the story. Um, fishing gear entanglements um, probably claim the most humpback whale lives um, uh, to date. So that's something is, you know, that, that is something that uh, may be a future threat and may require modernization of some of our fishing methods. But I, I don't know enough about it to say uh, what, what a solution would be for that. Um, so when it comes to return of the humpbacks, this is really exciting. So we're talking about the Salish Sea, which is down by um, where I live. And this is just a graph that kind of gives you an idea of, of kind of the increase in whale sightings um, in an area. So this is where I grew up. I grew up um, in a little town called Sydney, British Columbia on Vancouver Island. And like I spent a lot of time um, at the beach, on the water, looking out at the water, um, canoeing, kayaking on, on a boat. Um, looking around this area and I was 31 years old when I saw my first humpback whale in the Salish Sea. I had not seen one um, prior to that and so the number of sightings has a lot to do with kind of this this repopulation of the region and this 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 uptick in the population of humpback whales in the Salish Sea and and they're kind of uh, they're searching for more food sources and coming back in from the outer coasts and moving into the inlets and that kind of thing. So it's very exciting. This is just a nice graph to exhibit kind of the, the higher number of whales that are making their way um, into areas that they were previously extirpated. But um, with that in mind, this is the Salish Sea. This is also kind of sharing shipping traffic zones with um, Seattle, Bellingham, Vancouver. And so there's a lot of vessel traffic, um, which, and a lot of fishing as well that may, you know, have implications in particular if there's more and more humpback whales uh, in the region. So interesting. Now, when it comes to how do we know how many whales there are um, and how do we know kind of the different individuals and identify the different individuals, it comes down to whale ID projects. And each individual humpback whale um, has a distinctive um, tail fluke design. You can see the three tail flukes on the screen. One, two, three, they're all very different. Um, it can come down to, to scarring, coloration, um, pieces of the fin might be missing. Um, see these two little black dots, those are pretty distinctive. Um, and then also same with their dorsal ridges. You can see this one has a sharper ridge. This one almost has no, uh, no fin at all. They're just a little lump. And then this one almost looks a little sharper, uh, kind of like a sharp peak. So if we wanted to identify each of these individual whales, I could take this picture here and I could send that into researchers or I could consult with a catalog of whales that are known to frequent Northern British Columbia waters. I could consult with the, the Iceland catalog for this whale and I could consult same with these ones, uh, Iceland here, um, BC here and, and figure out which individual I'm looking at, where they migrate to and all that kind of stuff. So um, with that in mind, you know, they're relatively easy to 
um, identify and track. You just need to see that tail fluke and you just need to get that dorsal ridge and you can, uh, you can know which individuals are there. And what that's doing for research is it's providing more of a life history um, for, for each of these whales. It provides kind of a, a bit of a roadmap or, or a, water, a, a chart as to where they've been traveling in the ocean, how long they've been in certain areas, how long it's taken them to migrate certain, re, uh, certain distances um, and basically create a much, uh, a significant catalog of information about humpback whale populations around the world, um, which is pretty interesting and pretty cool. And with that, folks, I thank you very much. And uh, I love humpback whales, and I hope you do too. Thank you. You definitely made me a humpback whale lover. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you so much. Before we start the q and I just want to remind everyone that they can submit their questions via the questions field in the control panel. Um, so you, you did touch on this, but there was a lot of, of folks who were interested in what you think is the best place to see humpback whales. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, geez, so it, it depends. Like the places that I've seen humpback whales, I've had phenomenal experiences um, in British Columbia, like the bubble net feeding um, on Nat Hab's, um, the, sorry, excuse me, the, um, the Spirit Bear and Humpback Whale Trip, that, that sailing expedition, that's an extraordinary, extraordinary way to see humpback whales and also bears. Um, and then also the new Haida Gwaii trip that they're doing is another sailing expedition, but that's a very important area for uh, for humpback whales so there's a good chance you'll see them there um, but then again like Iceland um, we're in the in the west fjords which is where we go we're the only you know we're the only whale watching boat out there and we have some really spectacular opportunities there so I would I would say that like all three of those are great um, if you want to see kind of the the calving and breeding activity you have to go to Mexico or Hawaii um, or, or other southern regions around the world to see that. Um, yeah, I mean, there's no bad place to see a humpback whale. That's, that's it. <laughs> um, moving on to eating. Um, how much food do they need to eat every day? And then related, do they have to eat every day or can they store food and skip a day here and there? Yeah, so when they're, that's a great question. When they're in their um, summer feeding grounds, so in British Columbia, we see the humpback whales kind of, they're some year round, but there's they're the kind of the, the big influx of humpback whales typically happens kind of April, May, June, July, August, September, and then they start to fizzle out towards October as they make their way south again, um, or to Hawaii. Um, during that period of time, that's when they're kind of going for that 1,500 to 2,500 pounds of food um, per day, sometimes a little bit more. You know, whatever they can accomplish is probably great. Um, and then during migrations and that kind of stuff, um, they're, they can definitely go without food. Um, there, was, um, there was a document uh, or basically a, a tracker put on, or not a tracker, sorry, using the, the dorsal, sorry, Using the tail fluke imaging and dorsal fin imaging, the whale ID, um, they identified a whale that was in Alaska that took 39 days to travel from Alaska to Hawaii. Um, it worked out as a constant journey of like five nautical miles or about six miles an hour. The entire journey and, and whales are not exactly fast uh, or humpback whales are not exactly like speed racers. And so that it's unlikely that through that whole journey, this whale stopped much to feed. Um, just to kind of give you an idea, but I don't know how long specifically they can fast. I'm I'm not sure either what, if anything, they're eating in um, Hawaii. But there's definitely kind of that boom bust mindset where they eat way more during the summer months and way less during the winter months. Hmm. Um, do the baleen plates grow and or regenerate over the course of a humpback whale's life? They do. Yeah, they do. They don't, uh, they just kind of, they'll, they'll break off and wear down over time and, and continue growing. Kind of that fingernail type uh, protein or harder, harder, uh, yeah, fingernail type material. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
do the females have any kind of song? Um, they they may make uh, trumpets and noises, but they don't have kind of the the humpback whale song that is characterized by the the males kind of entering into the breeding season. Mm -hmm. um, do the baleen whales? Let's see. I'm not sure if I understand this question. Do baleen whales interact with humpback whales? I'm thinking. Well, so, I don't know. <laughs> like other species of whales. I, I interact imagine with humpbacks? yes. Mm -hmm. So there have been accounts of humpback whales. Like this is just kind of in a general, they don't, they don't like interbreed as far as I know. They, you know, they share kind of migration routes in particular with like gray whales and humpback whales. Um, but there are accounts of humpback whales um, defending um, animals um, or defending, like it could just be kind of practicing defending smaller animals or sea lions from orcas. Um, it could be some kind of uh, practicing or defensive mechanism that humpbacks have. Um, and so I've, I've heard of that, but I, I haven't heard of, you know, a humpback whale. Oh, you know, I have, I have seen humpback whales and fin whales uh, feeding together. Um, but I think that might have been just they're both in the same spot, feeding at the same time, not so much a social interaction of, hey, let's go feed together. Got it's interesting. It. I, I'd love, I, I do, I'm always interested in kind of that inter interspecies or inter whale kind of relationships because there are other species of whale that hybrid, like the blue whales and the fin whales hybridize. Um, they breed, they have been noted to breed together. And there's also other marine mammals like the doll's porpoise and harbor porpoise that have bred together and hybridized. So it's kind of, there, there could be an answer out there. Um, definitely <laughs> in, intriguing. Excellent. Um, are there any underwater warning sounds that could be projected ahead of a ship to warn whales away um, or sonar hearing devices that can listen for whales um, in order to help ships change their, their navigation? Um, that, I, you know, I'd be curious if something like that was out there. There are stationary hydrophones um, that uh, pick up the sounds of whales if they're if they're vocalizing. In particular, one of them is for killer whales um, on the northeast coast of Vancouver Island. And the uh, there's a, a place called Orca Lab, and they have uh, a series of hydrophones underwater that listen for whales, and they can kind of get an idea based on you know how loud the vocalizations are, exactly where these whales are moving, if they're moving away from the microphone or closer to it. So there's that, but I I can't say that um, there's there's a listening device for ships. You'd have to, I mean, ships create a ton of noise in particular with the engines and the propeller noise. And so I doubt they'd be able to hear much of anything ahead of them, behind them or around them um, mm. because they'd have to get away from the, their own sound. Um, but it would be it would be interesting to, to see about that. I think, yeah, I, that's, yeah, it'd be interesting what projects related to that are going on. Mm -hmm. All right, last question. Do you think the bubble net feeders make noise to coordinate their actions or to scare the prey into concentrating within the net or both? I would venture and say both. It just seems so, um, the, the noise is part of it, but the, the bubbles themselves, like, you know, if you have hundreds of thousands of bubbles that are being, you know, blown from the, the blowholes of these whales swirling up, those are going to make a whole bunch of noise as well as they rise up through the water column. Um, and then when I was listening to the hydrophone, it just, it really seemed like, you know, there's, it, it's like the starting uh, pistol at a, at a race, right? It's just like trumpet, trumpet, and then like three seconds, and then whales are at the surface. Um, it really seemed like it was a coordinated, okay, everybody up to the surface. Um, from my observations. Mm, fascinating. Um, well, I'm gonna turn it back to you for some closing comments. Uh, well, I sure hope that uh, I've inspired you to go out and find some humpback whales because they are absolutely uh, one of my favorite species of animal to watch uh, in the wild. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for taking the time to present to us today, Eddie. And I want to thank our viewers for sending in such great questions. We didn't get to all of them, but um, hopefully we'll we'll hear from Eddie again soon.
Um, please join us again tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone.